Dear friends, dear sisters and brothers in Christ, welcome to Congregation of God's People on this seventh Sunday after Pentecost. Welcome to Radgas Presbyterian Church, Church of Open Commensality, which means that our embrace is open to everyone. Although today with the temperature and humidity, I think that we will rather embrace some kind of cold drinks or something like that. So you have uh, big fans. Uh, I'm a big fan of Rutgers Church in your pews uh, or on your seats, use them. There are fans here and more fans are actually coming electrical fans, but they will be delivered, we were told, on Monday. So for those who are worshiping with us online, we welcome you. You are lucky ones. Uh, you are probably in air-conditioned places, so it is uh, lovely to have you with us. And uh, if you have any prayer requests, please post them on those uh, messages, and I will bring them up uh, during our service. Uh, after this a lovely prelude, which was for a time being uh, titled BMW 850, uh, <laughs> until it got corrected. Uh, I greet you with the apostolic greeting, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And now please join me in our call to worship. We come to worship. We come to worship. We come to worship. We come to worship. Come then uh, let us worship God.
Let us be in confession. Creator, in all our living, may we live with just enough for ourselves. May we take just enough from the land. May we use just enough power to birth good in the world. May we speak just enough words against the shadows that these words of hatred unmade, creating a new way of justice. In all our living, may we live with just enough for ourselves and find a new way of living treats the world with compassion. Amen. Please stand if you are able for the assurance of pardon. And God says, I will offer you more than you need for my forgiveness is endless. My love for you infinite, my care for you vast, my compassion beyond words. Know of this new way of living and shape the world in inclusive love. Thanks be to God. Amen. And after, and after hearing the words of grace, let us now turn to one another and those whom we see on a screen uh, also uh, and greet one another with signs of peace. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Peace of Christ. 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 We were promised that uh, I think that Harrison will be with us, but unfortunately Harrison is sick, 
So we will include Harrison, little Harrison, in our prayers. And for today, I brought again, and frankly, Edith, Edith was scheduled to be our leader of children message, and she got sick. So Edith will be in our prayers as well. There is so much viruses going around, so we really need an help of our friend. This is, do you remember the name of this guy? No, Theophilus is this one. This is Theophilus, this is Dr. Luke. And Dr. Luke is really needed here today and uh, to treat all those illnesses with his best skills and also with prayers. But today Theophilus is asking Luke, Luke, I am really curious to know more about the healings today, about healings and resurrections. And how did Jesus go around that? How did he make it happen? And I don't know, Theophilus, how it came about, but I know that Jesus almost always acted out of sympathy. Oh, would you know what it means? Would anyone help us here? What sympathy means? Understanding compassion, sympathy, is Greek for compassion, Latin. It is not helping us much. <laughs> so what is it? Like feeling for other people, feeling pity or sorrow or being sad for other people. And that is very important. But you know, what are your body reactions when you feel sad or sorrow, Theophilus. Oh, my heart here is broken. That's one way I'm describing it. Is it right? Heartbroken. Heartbroken. And would you know any other way? Any other way of describing how you feel when you feel sorrow or sad? Oh, tears, Mary is helping us. Thank you. Yeah, tears are rolling on your cheeks. That's correct. And pastor will tell us something he feels often when he feels sorrow or sad, and it's coming from the Czech language, and that is that he has a dumpling in his throat. You know, like suddenly you cannot almost speak. That's over here in your throat is a dumpling and you cannot almost swallow how you are sad. Don't you know that? Yeah. Lump, lump, yeah, lump in your throat. Oh, I'm learning something new. <laughs> now, you will learn something from Greek language now because Dr. Luke will tell you how it was in Greek. And it is description of Jesus right before he performed many of his healing miracles was. Would you guess what it might be? Just asking now, audience. Where did they feel sorrow, pity, or sadness? In their throat, we covered that, yeah, somewhere else, yeah. Stomach or their intestines, actually. Oh, it was not good to their digestions or to their, they were feeling bad to their stomach. But we say that we are sick to our stomach when something is offensive. But they said that when they felt really compassion or sorrow. That was when they went and were moved by pity. Splunkna. 
those were the innards. And splanknizomai, in Greek, we are learning, all of us, children including, meant to be moved by pity, to pity someone. So it grabbed them by their stomachs. That's a lovely way, actually, because it is very close to the center of being. Like we are saying that we have broken heart. So that is how Jesus was moved to the core of his being, and then he went and helped people. Did I answer your question, Theophilus? Oh, I learned a lot about how we feel. <laughs> and it is actually good, because I know that when I feel something is not right or needs fixing, that it is appropriate. Listen to your feelings. That's important. So let us now pray. Gracious God, we thank you for giving us different feelings and help us to listen to those feelings we have for others so that we can then reach out and help them like Jesus did. Amen. They will take a nap.
The scripture is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Soon afterwards, Jesus happened to go to a town called Nain, accompanied by his disciples and a great crowd of people. As he drew near to the gate of the town, a dead man was being carried out. He was the only son of a woman who was a widow, and a considerable throng of people from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had pity on her and said, Do not cry. And then he went up and touched the coffin. The bearers stopped, and he said, Young man, get up, I tell you. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And he gave him back to his mother. Deep awe came over all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has been raised in our midst, and God has taken note of his people. And talk like this about him went abroad in all Judea and in all the countryside. This is our gospel reading. Thanks be to God. The rising of the widow's son in a nine. This is a story unique to Evangelist Luke as we continue reading unique stories uh, from Gospel of Luke. But this resurrection is hardly story unique to Jesus, if you read the Bible. Jesus was known to resurrect people. Of course, you might remember quite a famous narrative from the Gospel of John about the resurrection of Lazarus directly from the grave after three days. Closer to our story is a synoptical tradition about Jesus bringing back to life the daughter of Jairus, a leader of the synagogue. But Jesus was not the only one and certainly not the first to perform resurrections in the Bible. In the Hebrew Bible, in 1 Kings 17, it was prophet Elijah who returned to life the son of the widow of Zarephtha. And then there is Elisha, a clone of Elijah, prophetic clone of Elijah, who perform almost identical miracle with a little son of Shunammite woman in 2 Kings 4. But the Bible was not the only source of stories about miraculous resurrections and revivings. For instance, 
Pliny the Elder, the Roman historian and naturalist, in his natural history, told the story of a doctor in Rome, Asclepiades, or Asclepiades, of Bithynia. He found a new medical school as he became famous for treating people with wine. What a lovely idea. Um, one day, Asclepiades encountered a funeral and interrupted the ceremony, asked that to be removed from the pyre, because it was in Rome. They had cremations. And after that person being removed from pyre, brought him back and saved his life. Many similar accounts circulated in late Hellenistic and later in Roman times among the Greek and Latin speakers. But probably closest to our story about resurrection in the nine is related by Philostratus, Lucius Flavius Philostratus, in his book about Asian miracle worker called Apollonius of Thyana. And here I will ask uh, Heather to read for us that story from Philostratus. In case you're wondering, this is from book four, paragraph 45 of Vitae Apolloni. Here too is a miracle where Apollonius worked. A girl had died just in the hour of her marriage, and the bridegroom was following her bier, lamenting as was natural his marriage left unfulfilled. And the whole of Rome was mourning with him, for the maiden belonged to a consular family. Apollonius, when then witnessing their grief, said, put down the bier, for I will stay the tears that you are shedding for this maiden. And with all, he asked what was her name. The crowd accordingly thought that he was about to deliver such an oration as is commonly delivered to, the gra to grace the funeral as to stir up lamentation. But he did nothing of the kind. But merely touching her and whispering in secret some spell over her, at once woke up the maiden from her seeming death. And the girl spoke out loud and returned to her father's house, just as Alcestes did when she was brought back to life by Heracles. And the relations of the maiden wanted to present him with a sum of 150,000 sesterces. But he said that he would, feel he would freely present the money to the young lady by way of dowry. Thank you. Thank you for reading for us from Philostratus. And you see, healings and miracles. Like we have in the Bible, there are nothing unique at that time. People in Greek times or ancient Greek times, I call it Hellenism because it's that period of time uh, closest to uh, our New Testament times. So people in Hellenism developed a special interest in accounts of these kind of marvels, wonders, something unique and mysterious. They collected marvels and their writers recorded them from all corners of their world, more ethnic and more exotic they were, the better. Biblical accounts of healings and miracles fit right in. It is almost like today, uh, Heather mentioned that uh, uh, zombies stories, you, you know. So these days it is horror stories and zombie stories and maybe science fiction would be like top notch, you know, what is hype among the people. So back then, that was this kind of finding these miraculous stories. You know, I find it actually very nice and uh, interesting because they were more open towards the future. And that'll be part of my message. Well, you know, when you are talking about zombies, <laughs> it's, it's about talking about your fears and, and your past, 
rather than about the future. Maybe science fiction is kind of oriented towards the future. So they, with the biblical stories and accounts of healings and miracles, they fit right within this atmosphere of that time. Zeitgeist, it's the spirit of the time or spirit of the culture of that time. Including occasional miraculous magical gestures. You can probably record the Jesus spitting on the ground or making a mud out of the spittle and you know, putting it on people's eyes or touching their tongue if there were, uh, was a mute person or something like that. That fit very neatly in. Strange and foreign words were a special interest like we have in the Bible even, and we are using them until today. Like, amen, hallelujah, maranatha, hosanna. And more towards the healing now, or resurrecting, talitha kum. That was that phrase preserved in that story about Jairus' daughter. Uh, young lady, get up, Talitha Kum. I actually learned that it is even a name of non-profit organization within Roman Catholicism against the, the, the people trading. Uh, so that is, again, fitting very neatly within that. And last but not least, there were reactions of of those observers, those people around. And the Greek words of phobos or tauma are very often used. Phobos means fear, but not like fear, fear. It's the religious fear. It's like awe. And tauma is wonder or marvel. And we have it in our story. The people were struck by fear, if you paid attention. Christianity sailed this Greek wave or Hellenistic wave and happily participated in this zeitgeist, as I said, in this spirit of the time. It isn't at all surprising that for all the gospel healings and miracles, we can find close Hellenistic pagan parallels. I told you that the early Christians and their authors, like Evangelist Luke, fit perfectly in. But that has been a great problem for many Christians, theologians and commentators. They twist themselves into pretzels trying to prove why Jesus' miracles and other Christian miracles in Acts of Apostles, for instance, they're real, unique, and different, while those others, which we hear from the contemporary sources, they're just forgeries. I am not buying it. What is wrong with Jesus being portrayed? like those other contemporary Hellenistic wonder makers, first of all. If we concentrate and insist on the uniqueness of Jesus or our faith, we might miss the forest for the trees. First, that Hellenistic religion, curiosity, and interesting religious inclusivity is in the place. Our own faith in its early stages greatly benefited from it. You know, our faith was one of those strange religions coming from who knows where, obscure places like from Palestine, from Israel. And and people were kind of curious in those times. I told you that they were interested in those areas which they did not know, and so they wanted to know more. Then, most importantly, we miss the underlying ethos of all that focus on miracles and healings. Behind that, 
I read the deep longing for expanding the world of the possible. Expanding the world of the possible. Their deep longing for border, uh, broader possibilities, that premonition of deeper knowledge. Their longing for times when miracles and wonders will become a lived reality. That is what I see behind this interest. They dreamed about a future when miracles will be a norm. And they subliminally knew that the first step towards it was this open-mindedness, openness to knowledge and insights and enlightenment coming from all different places and strange and foreign areas. That cosmopolitan nature of their miracles, that is the shared dream about the miraculous resurrection and healings, radically inclusive, open-minded, open to unforeseen new possibilities. That is to me, seeing biblical miracles within their religious, cultural, and historical context. But as strange as it might sound to us today, miracle stories were just a dime a dozen, and Jesus and early Christianity just fit in. We might think, you know, oh, what, what a miraculous or uh, event, no. That was just a milieu. They brought their special emphasis to it, Christians. What message was modulated on those miraculous stories? That is what is really interesting. What is set in between the lines and under the surface of the miraculousness of those miracles? Christians were not afraid to be provincial, for instance. The miracle happened in Nain, in an insignificant village in Palestine. Yes, we now know where Nain was, but it is not absolutely certain. That's for sure. It did not happen on, especially it did not happen in Rome or in some major polis city of that time. It came from the outskirts of civilization, from the margins. That's where most interesting things are always being born. And friends, that is something for us to remember as Americans and especially as New Yorkers. We think of ourselves like being the center of the world. And in New York, the, for us, it is just New York and hardly anything outside. And here is that story which is from some periphery, really distant, like somewhere in the middle of cat skills, that's too sh close. I, we, we should go further afield, maybe Nebraska, <laughs> or, or even further away, outside of our continent. And there are important things happening which will impact our lives. So, Christians were not afraid to be provincial. Another aspect, Christians cared for the marginalized, their faith, their God. Jesus led them to care for the marginalized. Miracle done was done for that poor widow and not for a senatorial family like we heard for instance. And with a poor widow, that is the bottom 
of the bottom of that society, completely unprotected, especially as she lost her only son. And finally, another part of the message modulated on those miraculous stories, praise from the crowd. I want us to pay attention to this. I already mentioned that they were struck by fear, and I showed how it fits in. But there is an aspect of it which does not fit in with the rest of those stories around. And that is that the crowd is ex exclaiming, God has looked favorably, visited, or came to help his people, or God's people. That is the new dimension, new message modulated on the miracle story. Because in Hellenism, in that Greek period, miracles were for individuals, for me or for you or for individuals. That was their focus. Not here. They were expanding it. They were looking beyond. They recognized that those longings and desires and hopes of individuals are also part of community, beyond individual healings. Early Christianity broadened it, made it into a collective, social, communal desire and hope. That hope of healing, those miracles are shared and radically inclusive. Almost like these days we will call it public health. Does it translate public health or public, public health? Public health, you know, uh, like health department you know, which is making sure not individual people, but the community is well. Like with vaccination, <laughs> by the way, you know, or uh, having food standards and uh, caring for communities. Even individual healings are about our communal well-being in the end. True health is when community, when society gets healthy. There is nothing like private healing, selfish health care. That is another thing we need to remember. Because there are too many people who just want to have their insurance. You know, that's the way it is built here in the United States. You know, it's my private insurance and I should be not realizing that we depend on each other and then, for instance, communicable diseases <laughs> spread regardless of uh, these health insurances or other things. And in the end, having health insurance which is universal is the best thing for all us, all of us, and interestingly, they knew it already back then. And they recognized that the healing probably went even beyond just and well-being and health of individual, that it went into a political sphere and well-being of the society. There is nothing like private healing, even for God, or especially for God. And even with miracles, there is primarily public health, universal health care, especially for the periphery of the society, for the outskirts, and for those who are marginalized. Now I will invite you to join me in our affirmation of faith, which is taken from the brief statement of faith of Presbyterian Church USA.
If you can, please stand. We trust in, in Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, fully human, fully, human, fully, fully God. God. Jesus, Jesus proclaimed, proclaimed the reign of God, God preaching good, good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and, and blessing the children, healing the sick, and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Amen. If you would like to make a contribution to Rutgers Presbyterian Church, please consider mailing in a check to the church office, or if you prefer to pay online, you can find the link to donate on the About page of our website, www.rutgerschurch.org. If you are worshiping here with us in the sanctuary, we will resume the passing of the collection trays. Traveling through this world of war, yet there's no sickness, toil, or danger in the bright world to which I go.
dedication for all that you give to us we give you thanks and we return a portion here may our gifts in their turn answer others needs and help others in their distress please be seated uh, now a few announcements uh, after the service, we have new members uh, meeting. On Tuesday, we have Resistance Bureau, and then there is this new thing in summer where we are meeting on the fifth floor for those uh, classical black and white films. Uh, it's struggling with faith. I call it torturous films because they are like... Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to attract people through uh, actually showing that it is serious. Those are the, almost like tragedies. But, you know, you cannot have catharsis without actually facing the fears. So that's, uh, and this uh, Tuesday will be a diary of a county priest. Uh, so come last uh, Tuesday we had the seventh seal, uh, and it was lovely. There was hope. 
And there was hope, of course. Yeah, and there is always hope. So uh, that, that's part of that catharsis. So if, if you have uh, on Tuesday evening time, uh, just join us on, it's air conditioned. That's the other thing. They, they insisted of being it in an air conditioned room. I, I thought that it'll be more appropriate for the theme to be actually in sanctuary so that the torturous films will be with a torturous atmosphere. <laughs> I should probably stop here. So. And then next Sunday uh, will be uh, the service at 11 o'clock with uh, children having their Sunday school uh, in person and on Zoom. And uh, am I forgetting anything? Deacon's meeting is on Wednesday. Uh, online uh, and at I see at four o'clock is it correct so uh, Wednesday at four o'clock and there is on Thursday our regular Thursday night meal program that's mostly it I, I have here some prayer requests so when the time now will be uh, the joys and concerns Beverly and Gabe what a beautiful gifts you have given us today. Thank you so much. Is there anything you'd like to share with us? I was just going to say my joy is being back. So hello, it's great to see everybody. <laughs> being out of the heat and humidity of Louisiana. Sorry, Susan. Oh, <laughs> Lord, and Thanksgiving. I'd like you to pray for the Tachi family. Joe Tachi dropped dead on, anyway, for the family. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Anyone else? Um, prayers for my friend Leveda, who's undergoing chemotherapy and has lost her gorgeous mane of hair and is braving it beautifully. Lord, in your mercy. And from online, um, I need to scroll now. Uh, Lane Maurer, uh, her good friend, uh, friend's brother, was just diagnosed with a rare and serious form of cancer. She's not a believer, but she and her family still need prayers, whether or not they know it. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Let us continue with those from our community. Let us pray for Mohammed, our staff person whose wife has received their third son. Their baby is happy and healthy. Lord, in thanksgiving. We pray for Edith Matundi as she waits for her child. We pray for her in special ways because she has contracted a virus and her baby is imminently to be in this world. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for Marty Hodap and trust that he is recovering from his surgery. We pray for Alice Hudson at Amsterdam House, for Chris Jones, who may be in a transition of his place of residence. We pray for Ula in her chemotherapy. We pray for Cynthia as she recovers from her accident. We pray for Jan Haber, Ula's son, who will have surgery tomorrow. And we pray for the return of Louisa and the Boy Scouts. 
all these things we lift up to you, praying for your mercy and thanksgiving. Lord, in your mercy and in thanksgiving. And now we pray for those who are dealing with the devastating effects of climate change. Floods and hot temperatures around the world. In Pradesh, India, in the northeastern U.S., deadly heat waves in California, Utah, China, and southern Europe. Drought in central and southern Africa and Australia. The heating seawater effects and sea life off the parts of the United Kingdom. This is a global challenge for the entire, entire world. We continue to pray for all those who live in the midst of war. And let us never stop praying and working for peace. O oh God, we give thanks for all those who seek to be your hands, your ears, and your hearts to care for our neighbors in need. We always receive more than we give. We so often are healed of brokenness and isolation in ourselves as we reach out in love to others. We remember all those known to us and those who are nameless, who struggle with challenges and anguish too great to bear. May they experience your tender mercies as together we pray. Gracious God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
and so dear beautiful community it is given to us to be and support and healers of one another just like we heard it is not private it's communal and in that let us now hear appropriate take within us but take with us out to share with people around us in this community and beyond its walls the Lord's blessing the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you the Lord shower you with favor and give you peace hallelujah amen